Welcome to Tech Teams Today. My name is Jorge Tellez. I'm Chief Community Officer at Revelo. And today's guest is Harley Blakeman. Harley is the founder and CEO of Honest Jobs, the leading fair chance employment platform in the US. He's also South by Southwest advisor, Techstars alum, and the author of Grit, How to Get a Job and Build a Career with a Criminal Record. Through Honest Jobs, Harley has helped over 600 companies, such as Amazon, Coca-Cola, and Koch Industries, find and recruit formerly incarcerated individuals. So Holly, welcome and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jorge. Super excited to see you again. And of course, to talk on the bottom or the, the video here. Yeah, so you have a really interesting story. Uh, and probably the most interesting fact is that you were actually uh, in prison. So how did you end up there? Yeah, so I, I, I've been to four different jails and one prison. Um, it was all in a very short period of time. Um, so de definitely a different, unique tech background. Uh, didn't, didn't have the traditional trajectory to being a founder. I, unfortunately I just grew up in a tough situation like many, many people do. Um, didn't have a, a lot of positive role models lived in kind of a, a I lived in a trailer park. So kind of a, a low end, uh, community in a small town. Um, in North Central Florida called Keystone Heights. The closest city was Gainesville, which is still a pretty small city. And uh, it was like 40 minutes away from where I lived. So we had one red light in the whole town. I think uh, my, I didn't graduate high school, but the graduating class was 1300 people, I believe, or no, might've been 130 people. <laughs> Very small numbers, a tiny school. So anyways, uh, my dad was a good role model um, but other than that, the community really, no one went to college, there wasn't good jobs. Um, and I didn't know it as a kid, but when I got older, I realized that most of the people in this community were drunk, like alcoholics, drug addicts. They, most of them had records of some sort. And really it was just a place of very low education, very low skill, no job opportunity. Um, so that impacted me later in my life. But when I was about 13 years old, my mom divorced my father. And it was because she got addicted to drugs and became an alcoholic. And she kind of disappeared from my life for, for many, many years. But at 13, she left my life. And then when I was 15, my father passed away unexpectedly in a motorcycle accident. He, he drove a motorcycle to work every day and got an accident and unfortunately passed when I was 15. And uh, that left me a homeless teenager. I had no other family. So it was just my older brother who like, just turned 18 but he didn't go to college. He had, he was working at like a grocery store back in groceries and he had already started to experiment drugs. And with the, my mom leaving, my dad passing, he got really addicted to drugs, heroin actually he went from painkillers to heroin. And at 15, 16 years old, I was just couch surfing, like staying with one friend for a couple of days, then another friend. And that caused me to just like not have clean clothes and not have transportation and oftentimes not have food and, and made me ultimately drop out of high school. Uh, at 16. And then uh, I sold drugs. I started using drugs and selling drugs. And uh, turns out I'm a, uh, I'd say I'm a natural born entrepreneur. I was pretty good at selling drugs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my, my, um, my business as an unlicensed pharmaceutical distrib distributor uh, came to an end right after my 18th birthday, I was taking a bunch of drugs to Savannah, Georgia. And uh, I got, I got caught. So I got arrested in Savannah, Georgia when I was 18 with a backpack full of prescription pills and marijuana. And, um, that landed me, uh, in jail, in, in jail for the first time. They took my car and all my money I had made and I put me back on the streets. I was homeless again, but with nothing. And while I was waiting to be sentenced for the drug trafficking charge, I was just living in desperation. I was, I was now a, a full blown drug addict, but I wasn't making any money. I wasn't selling drugs, but I was trying to get by. And I ended up getting arrested multiple times for shoplifting. Like I was literally stealing food. Like I was stealing like basic necessities because I didn't have money to feed myself while I was waiting to go to prison. Uh, and that's kind of how I ended up in jail several times before getting sentenced to prison. So then, uh, you know, you are 18 years old, uh, you get to prison um, and you have no uh, support whatsoever or very little. Uh, and how did you survive, you know, those, uh, those months uh, in, in prison? Like, how did you uh, figure out, you know, what to do and, and what, who do you want to be uh, afterwards? Yeah. Um, how did I survive? We'll just start with that. Um, 
first off, it was terrifying. Like, I mean, I hung out around drug dealers and, and kind of shady people and vi- even somewhat violent people, but I was always safe. I always felt safe. I was in my element in my town around people I knew, like I knew the environment. And when, when you get sent to prison, it's very different. Um, and I'm not a fighter. I've never been a violent person. I'm not an angry person. So that's, you know, could be a disadvantage, I assume, going into prison if you're if you're like, I'm just a nice guy. I don't want problems. But that was me. You know, I'm like, I don't want it. I don't want it, any of this. So, you know, I was actually 19. I was 18 when I got arrested, 19 when they okay. sentenced me to prison. So I finally got sentenced. I went to prison at 19. And I was also going to prison in Georgia where I didn't know anybody. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the criminal justice system in America is not... Um, fair in its punishment. So uh, black and brown people are disproportionately impacted by the criminal justice system. They're arrested at far greater rates. They're sentenced in far harsher. They're, they're given three years for something a white person might be given one year for. There's a lot of reasons that go into all that. But when you look at a prison, most of the time, the population doesn't represent the general population where the prison is. And where I was at in Georgia, I was in a, a dorm room with 84 people oh, in one room. Okay. So no cells. You couldn't, you couldn't shut your door ever. Okay. It was triple story bunk beds. So three story bunk beds, oh, 84 people in one room. And you know, if, if you, if, if someone is mad at you and you can't walk away, mm-hmm. you can't even shut your door. In fact, you have to sleep in the same room as them where they could just do anything to you when you, once you go to sleep. Oh. So not the best environment. You know, my first day going in was terrifying. They shaved my head completely bald. I'm super pale, baby face. Like they know you're new. They know they know you're just getting there because you're coming in with all your stuff in your hands and your head shaved. And um, I mean, the scariest thing you could ever imagine. I think even even if you're not an 18 year old kid, like this is not a situation you ever want to be in. So luckily, um, it turns out that it, it was not as bad for me as I thought it was going to be. I think generally... TV likes to focus on violence and gangs and all this stuff, you know, American media. But the truth is, is I met some really great people there. The, my bunk mate was a Christian through and through who immediately, you know, offered me stuff. And I said, dude, I don't want nothing. Stay away from me. I don't want anything. Because mm-hmm. that's what I was taught was like these people, if they try to give you something, don't take mm-hmm. it. But it turns out he genuinely was like, hey, man, I'm a good Christian guy. I just can't quit smoking crack. I keep smoking. I keep getting arrested for smoking. But like, I take care of my mom. I love my family. Like, and, um, you know, a lot of people while I was in prison turned out to be decent, good people. Um, but it was, it was really scary and it took me a while to get, uh, acclimated to the environment. And I think one of the ways I was able to survive was pr- not letting pride be, uh, an instinctual factor of how I operated. A lot of people in general, but especially in prison operate on pride, where if you say something to them, they feel like they have to say something back or they have to act on that to prove um, that they're not one to be messed with mm-hmm. or whatever, you know. And uh, oftentimes these are these are kids, young guys that are in really desperate situations that need help. But the only instinct they have is to look tough and to try and prove that they, they, they can survive. So for me, I avoided I learned from interactions pretty quickly. Like I took someone asked me to play cards with them. I was playing cards with them and they said something really off putting to me. And I was like, I was smart enough to be like, I'm just not going to do that anymore. So like I learned to navigate by reading the room, reading the people. Um, and luckily I didn't get, I didn't even get punched one time. Mm-hmm. Didn't even get touched. Wow. Amazing. Uh, you know, going in, going in, I was thinking the worst, you know, you always hear sexual assaults and all these things. Never gotten any fights, almost did a couple times, but, you know, weekly I saw brutal, brutal fights, like where people were six, seven people beating up one person. And uh, because there's a lot of gangs in Georgia, too. And typically it was just because people didn't know how to read the social environment of where they were or like who they're talking to. And, you know, that's part of sales. That's part of sales. That's part of management. That's part of building a company is knowing who you're working with and how to navigate the situation. So I think I I had some of that going into prison, but I certainly learned a lot in prison that has been extremely valuable in business. And I, I've tweeted about it before how I think I learned more about business selling drugs and going to prison than I did in, in business school. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, not that it's a path that you uh, will want to recommend to uh, 
definitely <laughs> not. Yeah, definitely not. From the entrepreneurs. Um, and, you know, that takes us to the, ne to the next stage um, of, of your life, which uh, is, um, you know, you uh, started a company, but, um, you know, the interesting thing is um, that this company was, um, you know, trying to, um, to help um, people, um, you know, with, with past records, like get a job. And I wonder, like, how did you, um, you know, discover like this niche? How did you, um, how, how were you motivated into build, build something like this? Yeah. Yeah. So just to preface a little mm -hmm. bit, while I was incarcerated, I got my GED. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to focus on things that could kind of take me away from where I was and reading books and studying was one of those things. Um, so I got my GED. I read a ton of books. When I came home from incarceration, I got a, a dishwashing job. Uh, that's pretty much all I could get. And it was because I knew someone who knew someone got me a dishwashing job making like eight twenty five an hour. But while I was there, I was working at a restaurant where there was, you know, servers and stuff that were 16, 17 years old. And I heard these kids saying how they were getting into college and they were so excited to, to go to college. And I said, I was like, man, I wish I could go to college. I'd love to study business. And they, one of the girls was like, you can go to college. Mm. I was like, no, I can't. And she was like, why? And I'm like, cause I have a prison GED. No one's going to let me in. And she was like, you could go to the community college. And that's all, that's really all I needed to know. She was like, just go to this website and there's like a form to fill out and they'll get, they'll pay for it. They'll give you student aid and everything. And I just went home and filled it out. And sure enough, I got into community college. It just like didn't, never in my life had I ever thought about going to college. Just like this new environment. I'm around decent people who like are giving me tidbits of positive advice rather than shit, like tons of negative advice. And, um, Got into community college, did that for a year, did really well because I was just pouring myself into my work. And I got into Ohio State University. I transferred. So I applied to Ohio State University just on, on a whim. But I had straight A's in community college mm -hmm. and I got in. And business school was the turning point for me. So I, I studied business in undergrad and I was volunteering in prisons and helping people. And my senior year, I started to dabble in entrepreneurship. I created an <laughs> online learning community. Mm -hmm. Uh, where people could learn how to rebuild their credit, find a job, get uh, get get into an apartment or a house, because these are all things people struggle with when they have a record, um, building social capital, like all these different classes. And I had like 40 people a month, pay, uh, 40 people paying me like $7 a month to be a part of this. Um, and this is where I start to get into entrepreneurship is I graduate from college. I apply for 100 jobs. Every, every company interviewed me. Every single job I applied for gave me interviews because my resume was great. I had a great resume, almost a 4.0 GPA. I mean, I wanted to work for, I had worked so hard. I had good grades. I was top of my class. I was like, I was the treasurer of a student organization. I had done a consulting project with an exclusive MBA cohort. Anyways, Rolls-Royce, Boeing, you know, Ernest & Young, all these consulting firms, they all interviewed me. Zero job offers. They all uh, no one made me a job offer after hearing about the background check, graduated unemployed, top of my class. Whoa. The, the news, the local news covered my graduation. Like the day of graduation, if you watch the evening news, they told my story of this underdog story, but no one would hire me. So four months after graduation, I finally got my first job offer. And I ended up writing the book you referred to, How to Get a Job and Build a Career with a Criminal Record. But I'll tell you, I didn't write that book because I just did it perfectly. I wrote that book because it was so freaking hard that I'm like, if it was this hard for me, I'm in my mind thinking of all those young guys I was in prison with who have dreadlocks and neck tattoos, and they're going home to a broken home where there's no positive support, and they don't have transportation, and they do have financial health uh, and, and like other health issues. Just so many barriers. So I wrote the book and the book sold thousands of copies. I got invited to the White House. I was still volunteering in prisons and I had this job and I was doing this online community. So I really just like, I was working nonstop. I wasn't happy in my job and I really wanted to go all in on working with formerly incarcerated people. And so I did. And when I went all in I, really quickly, I found this like online weekend long accelerator. It's a three day accelerator and it's free. And one of the things I did was I surveyed my, my 40 people that were paying me seven bucks a month and pretty much unanimously, they said that the real problem we have is we can't find a job. And when I looked at my users, those 40 users, I said, these are skilled and educated people. 
This isn't a matter of I need to train them or they need education. This is a matter of there's a gap in the market. There's like a there's major friction between 10 to 15 percent of all workers in the United States are being mismanaged, which represents billions of dollars in lost income and honestly, GDP. Like when we talk about the macro economy, we're talking about 10 percent of 10 to 15 percent of the workforce of, you know, the power of the world, the United States, and we're, we're, we're missing essentially 10% of the, 10 to 15% of the U S workforce. So, um, I decided to lean into jobs and very quickly, uh, you know, before I was making 250 bucks a month, uh, I, I found a company that said, yes, we'll hire people through you. I referred about seven people for those manufacturing jobs. They hired someone literally the first day and they get, they wired me $500. Wow. And I was like, okay, I was like, okay, I can do this. Uh, Now I'm making some money. All right. So now how do I scale this? And, you know, if you talk to me three and a half years ago, I would think I'd be a billionaire by now. I thought that it would be so much easier, but uh, we're, we're figuring it out. We're growing, we're building a nice team. We're building the technology to make it easier for every company to do it. Um, But that was my transition to entrepreneurship uh, and the work that we do was out of the pain. Like I was just pissed off. I was like, this is BS. Like, yes, I made a mistake, but I've paid my society. I've come back and I've actually been a great citizen. I'm doing everything right. Going into debt to do everything right to prove to society that I can, that I can just have a normal job and then I can't. And just, it's way bigger problem than most people think. And media has everyone convinced, and especially politicians, this is a this is definitely a political issue that people use. You know, people use the border as a political pawn. People use criminal crime and people with criminal records as a political pawn. It's one of those issues where it does not benefit anyone in this country to continue to punish people after they pay their, there's just no way to paint it where it actually is beneficial to anybody. Uh, so I'm passionate about it, as you can tell. But um, please, please ask a follow-up question if I didn't completely answer your question. Yeah, no, uh, this is amazing. Um, and then, uh, you know, you uh, decided to solve this issue, as, as you mentioned, and um, you started uh, a company trying to solve like a very um, difficult issue. Um, and also you started this company uh, during the pandemic, um, you know, in, and I wonder, like, uh, you know, how did you uh, figure it out? Uh, you know, how did you were able to adapt to that, to those circumstances, um, you know, without being able to hire like a, uh, you know, fully local team, um, you know, maybe like the access of capital was reduced um, d- during those times. Like, how did you navigate it um, during uh, all those times? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I oftentimes think that I'm crazy. <laughs> like, I oftentimes look at how much I work and I'm like, I am killing myself and my family and my fiance and they're suffering because I'm working so hard and like, there's a chance this could all fall apart. And I worked all the time for nothing. Mm. Or maybe I, or maybe I'm so successful. I help millions of people and I'm rich, but I don't have any relationships because I work so much. And the way I like to think about this is like real good entrepreneurs are like five-star athletes, like people in the NFL and the NBA, you know what they, they train all the time. They eat a certain way because they're pro athletes. They train hours and hours a day. Then they work. And like, they fit life in to the opportunity that they have, which is to be an NBA player or an NFL player. Like they don't have normal lives. They work all the time. And it's very similar for an entrepreneur. And now the question is we work all the time before we're, we've made it. Uh, but I like, I like to give myself a break and say, I, I'm operate. I'm trying to operate at a level that you have to act differently than everybody else. Like you can't drink every week and you can't go to every football game and, and you can't go to every party and you can't do all the socialization. But I think for the most part, I was extremely passionate and hardworking. And that passion came from some people call it problem founder fit or founder market fit, which is when I have millions of business ideas, startup ideas. I write them down all the time. I get Sometimes I even think I'm going to start them. Uh, but what it comes back to for me is like, when I'm six months in and I still haven't made a dollar, am I going to care to keep working on this? Right. And this was a problem 
that I knew so much about and I talked to so many people and I had personally dealt with and it had caused me so much pain. And that pain had been validated so many times by these other people I talked to. And we have users joining all the time that I was able to persist through so many trials and tribulations and running out of money and having unexpected challenges come that that passion has to be there based on some type of personal experience. And then, you know, you try to find employees that also, and it's hard as you grow a company, it's very hard to make sure every hire has this like passion for solving this problem. But as a leader, it's important to make sure that that's central to what you're doing, right? Um, I work to make sure that everyone in the company knows that what we're doing is bigger than me, it's bigger than us that there are millions of people that desperately need a chance to make money for their families and that we can help them do that. Uh, but also just on a tactical level during the pandemic, we got lucky a lot of times, you know, I think that luck is most of the time, you know, luck does happen occasionally or something just falls in your lap, but luck is, you know, always being on, always being ready, always updating everything to the best version of what you can possibly do at that time and juggling like i wear like 12 hats like i'm 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 slacking people and marketing ux customer service following up on invoices i'm doing so much and it, it, it's a lot that i don't think a lot of people can do um but it's important especially in the early days when you're pre i would say pre-revenue not pre-investment because a lot of people get investment and they think okay well now i can outsource everything to all these people i hired and that and that's wrong so I think uh, until you're getting solid, repeatable revenue from customers, you have to wear a lot of hats as a founder. And during the pandemic in particular, um, you know, when the pandemic started, we were, we had raised a hundred grand total and we had three employees. So it was three or four of us total. So we were still really young. Thankfully we hadn't just closed a big round and hired a bunch of people. And, um, but I did run out of cash. I had just decided to buy out my, my uh, old business partner. So I had just signed a contract saying I was going into tens of thousands of dollars of debt to buy out our early business partner. Pandemic hit, all of our customers unsubscribed, our paying customers basically, 90% of them unsubscribed. And I had just signed this, this promissory note that I was gonna pay him monthly. I still pay him every month. Um, but it gave me the opportunity to step back and say, okay, how do I rebuild from here? And that's also when we got invited to apply to Techstars. And I applied to Techstars and that's where we met, of course. And Techstars was great. It was really, really great for us. And luckily, you know, at that early stage in a startup, people are investing in the founder and how much they know an industry and some unique insight that they have about that industry that most people aren't looking at or seeing. And that was obvious, I think, with me. I think that's really what got Dan and Natty to, to see me as a really great opportunity. And I'm thankful for, for them because Techstars, obviously, I, we took the full 120 grand, which gave us a little bit of cash. But immediately when we were sitting with Taylor and Techstars, he's like, so how much runway do you have? And we're like, you know, six months. And he's like, oh, God. Like, you know, we were like already at that point where you should be fundraising again. Uh, luckily... Um, two mentors, Dan and Natty came together and said, Hey, we want to invest right now. So we didn't even have to wait till demo day. They, which has made me really happy that I'm, I don't see myself as a good uh, fundraiser. I really don't think I'm that great at fundraising. Okay. Uh, when I, when I meet people and pitch them, like I, I just pitched a 16 Z yesterday, they probably will not invest. And, but they wanted to hear my story. I'm just bad at pitching. But when people look under the hood of honest jobs and they see our culture and our mission, our passion, and even our, even the stuff that I'm not good at putting on a slide, they start to see the data and the behaviors, uh, they'll invest. So for instance, Harvard is doing a case study. I don't know if they'll publish it, but they're doing a case study on honest jobs right now. And the professor doing the case, the professor doing the case study emailed me and was like, hey, can I invest? I send him the safe, he signed it and wired me 20 grand. <laughs> so like, and this is after he had interviewed seven of my employees and some of my customers and investors. So he saw the raw truth of what's going on in honest jobs. And he was like, I wanna invest. So to me, that means a lot because it shows our hard work, our passion. Of course, we don't have everything figured out, but I'd rather be a business where I'm not great at selling, 
you know, I'm not great at selling you on this grand vision, but you know, once you get to know us, you believe that we're going to succeed. And I think, um, the really grit from my book, you know, grit, how to get a job and build a career, really just, that's the kind of the essence of what we've done is we, we're all passionate. We all wear multiple hats. We've been lucky to have investors who believe in us. It's not that they saw crazy hockey stick growth. It's not that they saw massive revenue. You know, we do have some really big brands mm -hmm. working with yeah, us now. Yeah, now I do. But uh, um, the last thing I'll say is um, I've been I, I've been lucky to convince really good people to invest in me as well. My first investor that gave me the first hundred grand during the pandemic, I was freaking out. And I'm like, man, we just got on deck stars. But even if we take the money, we only have six months revenue. I don't know what we're going to do. And this guy literally wired me 50 grand and just said, pay me back when you can. We didn't even sign a document. Okay. He just wired the business 50 grand. Yeah. So I'm like, uh, and, and, and he's an angel investor, right? So that's not normal. That is not normal for people to just be like, I got you, man. Wire the money. Uh, so really thankful for, for investors that have been, I feel like they're different than a lot of investors, the way that they've operated with, with honest jobs. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you yourself um, have built uh, a team as well um, with people that have, um, you know, that had been uh, formerly um, incarcerated as well. And I wonder, um, how did you uh, assemble them? You know, how did you assemble the team, um, you know, in, 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 in a way um, that actually can fulfill your mission, um, you know, that can um, demonstrate that what you uh, preach um, is, is, you know, is real? And what has been, um, you know, like the, like, like the benefits uh, from building a team uh, around these uh, individuals with unique stories? Yeah, so I'll tell you, it's a difficult task mm -hmm. to build a team. Um, there's a lot to consider. There's, you know, it feels soft and like, oh, it's not real. But like the mission and value, the value alignment is actually really, really important. Um, I also can't emphasize enough how much you should not hire based on credentials and how you should not hire based on pre even previous job titles or or college degrees or, or whatever, they, 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 can, they can be extremely misleading. Um, so I've hired incredible people who have very untraditional backgrounds who have proven to just be amazing. And I've hired people who had Ivy League MBAs with a great experience. And then I come in and I find out that they're, they kind of point and tell people what to do, but they don't do anything. Um, so, <laughs> or they're really good at putting together a presentation, but when you ask them to implement it, they're just like terrible at it. So, um, well, you know, I think you can't let anyone's previous experience allow them to hop into your organization in a way where they've earned it already. You know, and I think that's hard because tech startups are battling for the best talent. And I certainly don't think that if you looked at the people in my company, that people would be like, oh my God, he's got the former VP of marketing from, you know, Airbnb and the X, blah, blah, blah. Like we didn't recruit from these amazing companies. What we did was we, we found people who had uh, demonstrated the ability to do the work in some way, didn't matter how glamorous it was. And we found people um who were able to articulate why they really wanted to work for us. And what we see is that every time we ask that question, people are like, I want to do good. I want to help people. Um, it, it, that's just too easy of an answer. No, but We're looking for an answer where someone, we've seen people on interviews tear up talking about answering why they want to work with us wow. because it's just like, oh, well, I'm, I'm getting red eyed because I was interviewing a woman yesterday. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> is it Today, who said her son went to prison and when her son got out of prison he couldn't find a place to live so he had to move into the projects and he got shot and killed in the projects oh right after he got out of prison and she was like he didn't even live in that city he just moved in and because of his record he couldn't get an apartment in the part of the neighborhood i was living in so he moved into the rough part and we hear these stories and and you, you get something special when you hire someone who's qualified and capable but they have an emotional attachment to the mission of the company, you know, I hesitate to say it because I know eventually someone will quit honest jobs, but no one has ever quit. We had 18 employees, three and a half years in business. Not one person has ever left honest jobs. And I think it's because they, 
like it's such a problem that when you find other people who have that problem, it creates a bond where you truly feel like this, this people I'm working with understand me better than anyone ever understood me because the most painful experience in my life, the most challenging thing I've dealt with since it happened is something that we are solving together for a lot of people. So that's been incredibly valuable. I have hired people that were fresh out of prison. I actually hired a guy that was in a halfway house. He was, he interviewed me re- remotely and he said, my, they're going to let me out every day to come into the office. So this guy, mm-hmm. uh, He's in, De- he's in Denver. I hired him from a Denver prison facility. Uh, his name's Anthony Lopez, and he is a rock star. I mean, this guy, he is now leading our entire recruiting department. I hired him as an entry-level employee, and he's now leading the department. And the guy has work ethic like no one I've ever met before. And, you know, he could never get a job within with some other company interviewing from inside of a prison, you know. Um, so anyways, I think... Um, it's really tough and it was really hard and I still haven't figured it out. We we've actually, we've never had anybody quit, but I have had to let go of a few people and it's been extremely mm-hmm. difficult. It's important as entrepreneurs that you learn to go through that though, because it can actually, I feel like it can break people. Like if you have to fire a couple of people, you may not want to be an entrepreneur anymore. I mean, I'll tell you, it is not easy thing to do, especially when, you know, you're trying to help them. You're their friend, you're their ally, you're their colleague until the day you have to let them go. And it's really hard to go from being, it's a startup. Everyone's like this. We're working together all the time. And then one day, you know, you tell them, hey, we've talked about this a few times, but today's the day. Um, It's extremely difficult. And it's caused me to be better. It's caused my team to be better. You know, for these important roles, we're now doing three interviews and a working interview before we make an offer. Because we're, we're just like, we can't afford, they can't afford it. We can't afford it for them to come in, work for you know, it could be as short as 60 days. It could be as long as six, seven months and then have to get let go. So I think <clears throat> building the team has been a combination of intentionally not paying as much as maybe we could based on how much money we raised. Right. Mm-hmm. Cause that's, a, that's a check. Look, people want the big pay rate. And if you just raised a series A, you could pay them 200 grand a year to be your director of marketing, but you get a lot of insights into who, how motivated they are to help you build this company. When you say, I'm going to take 50 grand a year off of that and see if they still are interested. And, and the nice thing is, is we're not doing that to exploit formerly incarcerated people. We've done that across the board, including myself. Like I get paid less than some of my own employees. I have people in the company that have MBAs, don't have a record, have had amazing careers and they took significant pay cuts to join. I don't think this is right for everybody, but it's one of the benefits of having a truly mission oriented and really centered on why we're here is that not everyone is looking at how much more could I make if I went to this company? How much more could I make if I went to that company? They're actually focused on just doing their job <laughs> because they want, they want to see the positive impact. They want to see the work. They want to see the company move forward. Um, and we let everyone get their hands dirty. I mean, we're cross-functional. We let people move. I, I've, I've moved multiple people from, different departments to let them learn the company inside and out. And I'm fully transparent with everybody. I mean, we review all the financials every month on the all hands. They know how much cash we have in the bank. They know how much we're burning, how much, you know, they know when big contracts fall through, they know when good things happen. So there is a point in the company where that's probably not feasible to just let everyone know everything all the time. But transparency has been really a a, a great way to keep good talent as well. I I believe. Yeah. And um... please prod a little bit more if you want to dig in on any of that. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, you know, the, one of the things that, uh, you know, that happens sometimes when people think about uh, formerly incarcerated people is that, you know, they are all like, uh, you know, serial killers or that they have done like terrible things, you know, and so on. And yeah. that might give some companies, uh, you know, a pause uh, into using platforms such as uh, Honest Jobs in order to start this kind of uh, fairy chance program. So, uh, what would you tell to those people? Uh, how can they start uh, actually uh, implementing something like this? And what are the, um, you know, the, the, the preconceptions that they have to uh, get over uh, in yeah. order to work with Honest Jobs? Yeah, so I'll tell you what we've done and how types of crimes we've hired, how it's mm-hmm. worked. I'll tell you kind of like best practices for yeah. people who are interested in doing it. Um, I have hired probably 14, 15 people with felony convictions. Um, and, you know, there's 
about 70 million people with a record, but about 20 million have a felony. So that's where we get that 12% of the workforce. It's like 11 to 12% have a felony. Felony is a scary word for people. They hear the word felony. They think that must, like you said, they must be a murderer or, uh, you know, molest, child molester or something really, you know, scary. The truth is, is that America over polices their people. You know, whatever your view is on that statement, uh, it's just truth, right? We we are five, you, the U.S. is 5% of the global population, but we're 25% of the global prison population. Oh, insane. So we incarcerate people way more the than any other country too. does. And, and our, our law books, like the number of laws in America is insane. There's a book called Two Felonies a Day because it analyzed people and it said most people commit two felonies a day. It's just yeah. like, like there's actually a book about this. And I think it's hard to conceptualize it, but there are people in jail when you hear their story, you're like, what? Hold on. You're going to prison for two years for that? Or like, uh, or maybe they're like, okay, I guess it makes sense. But like, you're still struggling to find a job years later. And like, it's very surprising. So we have hired, basically what we do is when we have a job description, we post it on our, our platform and we, we will leave it there for months considering formerly incarcerated people first, because we learn from doing it ourselves on how to have other people do it good. Um, so if we do it, then we can teach other people how to do it. It's also central to our mission. We believe that by having people impacted by the problem we're solving, mm -hmm. that we will have more unique and valuable insights on the problem. True. Um, so, you know, whatever your customer is, if you can hire your customer to work at your company, then that's a good, that's probably a good hire. Um, and what we have found, so, so like I said, I've hired probably, uh, probably 15 total. I think right now I have like 13 maybe working for me. Um, and I've hired at all levels. My entire sales team has a record. My entire recruiting team has a record. And by the way, that's all the money we make. Mm -hmm. All the money we make is from those two departments. So <laughs> like pretty much, every, pretty much every dollar we make is coming through formerly incarcerated people. My software team is about 50-50, formerly incarcerated. Interesting. Um, and my leadership team, me and my chief of staff have have a felony. Uh, my CTO, Mark, who you've met, he does not, but he has. He said he's been in handcuffs before, but he doesn't have a record record. And then my v, my other VP doesn't have a record. Um, they've been incredible. Like literally, I, I I can't I can't identify anything that where they have not performed. And it has any correlation to because they have a record like they've performed really well. If you look at our revenue, I mean, uh, we went from last year doing five grand a month to now to like, let's say, 20 grand a quarter to now doing like 200 grand a quarter Wow, congrats! in, in a year. And that was from hiring formerly incarcerated people to lead sales and, and recruiting, which drive our revenue. Um, so that's how we've done it. And, and what we've done is sometimes the people who apply for those jobs, we don't consider them. And sometimes it is because of their criminal record. And this is where talking to someone like Honest Jobs can be really helpful. You know, you, you can do a consultation with us, or you can use our service, or you can do both. But a, in a consultation, what we would do is we would just review your jobs and say, hey, these are the types of crimes that you shouldn't hire people mm. who have these crimes. Okay. And that there's actually no law that says you have to consider anyone with a record. In fact, you can put a big thing on your career page that says we don't hire felons. And it's not illegal because it's not a protected class. Um, however, the best practice, and this is established by the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission, the EEOC guidelines say you need to consider the nature of the crime, the time since the conviction, and the nature of the job duties. So think about this. I had an executive assistant position posted six months ago, probably maybe, maybe nine months ago. And I had someone apply that I was very eager to hire. Um, I had two interviews with them, made the job offer, found out about their background, and it was a, a fraud charge. And actually, it was their second fraud okay. charge. And I could tell that this person had changed. The, the last, they had gotten charged twice, but it was over 10 years ago. They had done a lot to rebuild their life since then. But in this particular position, they were going to have access to the bank account, credit cards, company, and that's where you got to draw the line. You're going to say the job duties actually conflict with the nature of the crimes that have been committed. And 
you know, if this had happened once and it was 10 years ago, maybe I would have still considered it. But, you know, you got to take in all those factors. Yes. And there's still human bias and judgment in there, but at least you're following a logical framework to help you come to a decision. And I ended up hiring her, but for a different role. And she's been amazing. Mm -hmm. So I said, hey, you know, let me think on this. We have a couple other open roles. I ended up hiring her for that role. But by and large, we haven't had a whole lot of situations where specifically the crime was the problem. Typically, if you re review the job description in your company, most criminal records aren't a direct conflict. So if someone has a DUI, why does it matter? There's almost no jobs that it matters. They shouldn't be a truck driver. They shouldn't operate heavy machinery because basically the idea is that you don't want to expose your employees or your customers to risk by putting someone in a position to do the same thing again. So if she, this person committed fraud and I put them in a position to commit fraud again and they do it, and it's on you. well, I could have avoided mm -hmm. that. And, you know, and if you're hiring truck drivers and someone has two DUIs and you hire them and they get drunk and kill some people, then there's actually liability to the company. It's called adverse, um, um, adverse hiring. No, I'm forgetting the term. That's not good, but there's a term for it, uh, where, uh, negligent hiring. That's what's called negligent hiring. If you hire someone who it was kind of obvious that they could hurt a customer or, or an employee, it's very rare where that's clear. And in, in nine times out of 10, you can hire the person, but companies are so scared that that's what's going to happen, right? They're going to hire a serial killer that's going to murder everybody or, or, or somebody who's going to do this. And reality is, is like, these are your neighbors. One in two Americans have a direct family member who's been to jail or prison. I didn't know that. So these, it's not like these are like, it's not like these are like monsters hiding in the shadows and there's <laughs> one or two in every city. No, they're everywhere. They're all around us and they have families and they pay taxes and sometimes they get to vote and sometimes they don't, unfortunately, yeah. but um, yeah. That's interesting. Um, you know, and- Did I answer the question? The, I think there was a, there was a second piece to it. <laughs> no, there was, no uh, you did. Uh, it's- uh, yeah, like how um, leaders can actually start uh, these programs, but I think you 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 answer that uh, you know by considering their uh, you know, criminal uh, backgrounds, best practices, um, you know, and, and and all those things. And um, you know, I know that um, that you were a fully remote uh, company. I don't know whether you have stayed uh, as a remote company, whether you have uh, done some uh, hybrid model and so on. And I just wonder uh, what's your take on 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 the structure uh, of of your company in terms of whether they work remotely, hybrid, or uh, in person? Yeah, I mean, it's a difficult conversation because I, I, I don't take a strong stance on either at this point, and I've seen people take strong stances on each. <laughs> like, I was just at Denver Startup Week. There was a talk about working remote. And if that's good or bad. And one venture capitalist was like, I think it's, I think it's terrible. Mm. He's like, it's terrible for startups. Mm. And he made a really compelling argument for why it's terrible. And as a founder, I was sitting there nodding my head the whole time going, he's right. All the stuff he's listing is right. Like be, when you are a true startup, like early stage, like 10 employees or less, and you have an office with a whiteboard in a room and you're talking to customers in real time and you're sharing notes in real time and you're mocking up UX design in real time and you're and you're like, let's launch that now. Mm. That doesn't happen when everyone's remote because you have to have this is a scheduled Zoom call. Let's see who's available when. Okay, well, let's schedule it for Thursday when I've operated in environments before where we are, I mean, 20 things a day are happening because we're all in the same room and there's that energy. Now, there's also the needed mentality shift of becoming going from a founder to a CEO. And when you're going from a founder, you got to be able to juggle a million things, carry all the weight, work all day long. You want employees that want to do the same thing. But from what I've seen, you have to change your culture as you grow to be more flexible to people who have families. They want work-life balance. They want health. You know, I, we want to, founders want to solve world problems and become rich. Normal people are like, I want 401k. I want to make a little bit more than my neighbor. I want to have, you know, I want to have these things in my life. And I think that's a important thing to keep in mind is we haven't had anyone quit. And that could be because I give everyone the flexibility to work from where they want to work from. But I can tell you in a startup, when you come to the office and you're within an earshot of everything and you're 
you're in the know on everything and you always have the latest data because you're in the room where it's happening, I believe you're going to move up quicker. You're going to learn more faster. You're going to be able to implement more faster. So I think there's benefits to early early employees. Like if you can go into the office at a startup, it is an advantage in your career trajectory. I believe that uh, because, you know, of course, if, if you're if you're not hitting any of your KPIs and you're failing, sitting next to me in the office isn't going to help you. But, but um, I think that there's an advantage to, to in the office. So, but to your point, when the pandemic hit, we had two offices actually. Well, we had an office in Columbus. Um, I continued to go into the office every day because I was paying for it and I didn't want to sit in the house all day long every day. And we had one or two employees that would come in like three days a week, four days a week. But we just told everyone you can work from home. We bought everyone the equipment they needed to work from home. We let everyone work from home. And there's kind of no turning back after that. I mean, especially for the developers, as you know, like these people, a lot of software developers, like that's kind of, I feel like if I told them they had to come back, we might lose our first employee. I don't know. (laughs) But people are like, they really don't want to have to drive into the office every day. But I think remote's powerful because you can get better talent when you allow them to be where they want to be. You can find an amazing software developer in Maine, in Atlanta, in Mexico, wherever it may be, if they're good and they're showing up and they're getting their work done, this is a competitive advantage to companies to be able to get that. Um, And we're seeing that everywhere. Like people have left San Francisco because they're like, why would I live here? It's so expensive. I can do the same job two states over and and like pay like a third to have like a bigger house. Um, It's happening everywhere. And I don't think it's going away, but you're you know, you see companies, I think it's Apple that just announced everyone has to come back into the office. Um, that's an interesting move for them. I'll, I'll, I'm definitely watching closely to see how it plays out. But I think I think for me, um, a hybrid model is good. Um, personally, my mental health suffers if I stay inside all day, every day. And I'm a social person. I like to know what's going on in my employees' lives. And I like to have casual conversation occasionally. Um, and I, I've, I've never really found that sweet spot where I can schedule Zoom conversations. And they're like, what's this for? And I'm like, I just want to I just want to hang out and talk. Uh, so we, we have a hybrid. Uh, I'm in a I'm in a little we work here in Columbus, but it's because I'm a training an employee. We don't actually have an office in Columbus. We do have an office in Denver. And uh, the employees there, the way we structured it is your manager determines if you have to come into the office and if you do have to come into the office, how frequently. So for instance, we have had a manager that's like, Hey, I want this person to come in the office every day because they're new. And then after a month or two, they're like, look, you can work from home two days a week. And then eventually they're like, Hey, you can work home all the time. But then the manager also might tell me like, Hey, I'm going to request that that person come back into the office two days a week because I'm concerned about X, Y, or Z. So we've just left it up to the managers. So for instance, Mark and the, you know, Mark's like, Everyone works remote all the time, and that's his business. As long as as long as everyone's happy and it's working, it's working. I think that's uh, the right thing to do. But at that point, you got to make sure you hire good managers who are who are um, have a good sense of the culture you want, the outcomes you're looking for, and then that they're representing because they're basically like a an official who represents their department. You just want to make sure that they're acting. Uh, correctly, but that's been working really well for us. I mean, we have employees who come in uh, with no complaints and we have employees who haven't come in in over a year and we, we release updates all the time. The dev team's working. That's for sure. I, you know, they're doing something. So. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That, that, that's good for Mark. Um, but, um, you know, just, uh, I have like some uh, rapid fire questions, um, you know, and sure. I'd be interested in, in, in learning your answers. Um, so the first question that I have for you is, which was the latest book uh, you read? The Cold Start Problem. Okay. I just read The Cold Start Problem. I think it's a- Andrew Chen from, uh, I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> He's from one of those big investment firms. Yeah. Uh, it's a really good book for anyone building a marketplace or anything that has network effects. It's called The Cold Start Problem. Great book. Okay, I'll check it out. Um, which podcast are you listening to? The All In Podcast. Okay, what is that about? By, uh, um, it's about everything, okay. but it's um, a couple people I wasn't familiar with. It's like David Sachs, who is an early product manager at PayPal. Now he runs Craft Ventures. Um, 
David Kalanakis or something, or no, uh, Jason Kalanakis, mm-hmm. which he's like a famous podcaster, mm-hmm. startup guy. Um, I actually don't know their, their backgrounds all that well. I just listened to an episode while I was on a treadmill one day and I've kind of been addicted ever since then. They're, 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 um, they, they talk about mostly business, but they also talk about like anything that's major in the news. And it's interesting. They're all like, I think one of them isn't a billionaire, but they're all like really, really rich and they've gotten rich off of tech. And, um, but they, they work in all types of stuff. Like one of this guy just bought a giant, a giant farm in Brazil, <laughs> like an enormous farm in Brazil. And he merged it. He did a SPAC to merge it with like this ag tech company. And like, this is just like one of his like 30 businesses he's running. He's this like trillionaire guy. And, wow. but they talk politics, they talk global news, they talk startup. And, you know, they talked about like the Figma acquisition and how they analyze it all. And I just find it really interesting because they're also like, they have very different views. Like there's someone who's, he doesn't say it, but he's clearly like Republican-esque, like right leaning, but he's in Silicon Valley and he's a tech investor. And it's just really interesting to hear extremely intelligent people with no motivation to just argue about stuff uh, because they're not news anchors and they don't, they also point out that, you know, this podcast isn't monetized in any way. It's just four guys talking every week. Uh, So I like that. I've been learning from it. You know, I, I don't, I can't say I like all of them. I don't know them at all, but (laughs) I've listened to like five episodes now and I enjoy listening to it. Yeah. Uh, Which TV show are you currently watching? Truthfully, I don't really watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. uh, I, I really don't watch TV that much. I watch movies sometimes. Um, like in the background, on the other side of my laptop screen is the TV while it's on. Um, <laughs> the, the one I'm watching right now is uh, The Patient. Okay. Uh, which is on, it's on Hulu. Yeah, it. It's, um, it's really good. The guy from, you know what mm-hmm. I'm talking about? Yeah, like the the, guy the, from, the shrink and the, and the serial killer. Yeah, it's the guy from The Office. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I like it. Um, which tech personality did you uh, admire the most? Tech personality. I mean, probably Jared from Silicon Valley, <laughs> which he's. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, you know, I, I really don't like. I work all the time. Like, I, I don't follow tech news as much as I should. I think that's why I like this podcast, is I feel like I'm getting it all mm-hmm. without actually having to to like hunt down any of it. I mean, I don't, I don't admire really any of these people like Zuckerberg (laughs) or or Bezos or whatever. I I guess. Um, Yeah. I mean, I I think that all these people were just like interesting. They worked hard to, to, to obsess over a product until millions of people love their product. Like I, I don't know that any of them have done anything that like, you know, like I admire, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. and like people who did like great things for the world, mm. not necessarily startup founders, you know, like <laughs> that's fair. I, I hope I do something great for the world more than d- building like a tech product. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so which is the most uh, critical piece of advice uh, you would give uh, tech leaders? Yeah. I mean, going back to your last question, like identify yourself as someone who's doing something huge and, and, and great for the world. I think that's my advice is like center yourself around something huge. That's important. Um, and then, um, learn how to be disciplined on the business side. I mean, pay attention to your money, know how the money's going out, scrutinize expenses constantly. Like the last thing you want is to take money from people you don't want to work with and you only really know how badly you don't want to work with them. And after you've had their money and now you have to work with them. And, you know, I think entrepreneurship's fun until, until it's not. And when it's not, it's usually too late to go back, you know? So like just uh, grass is not always green on the other side. Remember that, that like, you know, one of the things I've been telling myself is wouldn't it be great if, if, investors pitch founders on taking their money rather than founders taking investors on on investing and like yeah and that's kind of how the world should be it's like they've set it up to where we beg them for money but the reality is is that we are the vehicles and how they get rich and if you can be disciplined enough to just say well if i just raise six months later than when i think i should i can actually have them asking me if they can invest Mm -hmm. right so i think 
just like be a business. Don't just be a fundraising machine and a product and dev team. Like try to be a business. You know, and right now is probably the best time to hear this advice is like, be a business. Don't be a startup. Like try to be a business because, you know, the market's bad right now. Maybe it'll get better. Or maybe it'll get worse. I'm not sure. But I think at the end of the day, um, you, a lot of startups aren't creating any value. They're burning money. They're using space. They're using their precious time. You know, like I'm turning 31 tomorrow. I'm still young as hell, but I'm like, I don't want to work on some. I don't want to work on some for another 10 years if it's if it's not going to uh, be successful, which is that urge to like raise money so you can grow it fast. But at the same time, like what we're doing is important. I don't want it to die because I try to get too aggressive. So I just encourage people when you first started building businesses and raising money, it's so easy to get hyped up. by like, we got to raise, we got to raise, we got to raise. No, no, you don't. You really don't try to figure out how to not raise until you need it. Um, I want to raise but I also don't have to raise right now. Um, and anyone investors watching, I'd love you to call me and pitch me because I'm, I, I might take your money if, if, you, if you pitch it right. <laughs> That's good. Um, so any parting words uh, you know, to our audience? Um, I just appreciate the time. I think uh, Jorge is an amazing guy. I've gotten to know him a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and Techstar is an amazing guy. And look, if, if you... Want to learn more about the topic we're talking about here? You can follow me on LinkedIn, Harley Blakeman on LinkedIn. I'm 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 uh, LinkedIn famous for talking about this stuff uh, openly on LinkedIn, and uh, you can go to honestjobs.com. Um, we bought the M, so we're no longer honestjobs.co. We're honestjobs.com, and uh, it's free to join if you're a job seeker or an employer. You can use our services for free. Perfect. We'll make sure uh, to include those uh, links in the in, in the description. And uh, Harley, thank you so much uh, for being with us today and for you uh, all watching. Uh, see you next time. Thanks, man. Great seeing you again.